Uh, you're going to find that this is a very interesting uh, lecture that you're going to find, uh, you're going to learn an awful lot today. So enjoy. Here's Mr. Ed Sanders, and he's going to tell you a lot about China, from copycat to digital innovator. Enjoy. Thank you. So let, let's first, let me uh, introduce myself shortly. Uh, my name is Ed Sander. For those of you who speak Chinese already, uh, my Chinese name is Aide. And in 2011, my background is in, in database marketing and in online marketing. And in 2011, I decided to do some volunteering work. So I became an international volunteer and I worked in the city of Xi'an for several very small NGOs. And I was basically helping them uh, to do their, uh, their marketing, their promotion, to do their fundraising. And it was really in, in those kinds of organizations where you have each NGO could maybe have four or five people. You were sitting like in this picture uh, around the, uh, the kitchen table and teaching them the very simple basics of, uh, of marketing. So when I was there, I eventually was asked by a website you probably don't know called Customer Talk to write about China, especially write about e-commerce and social media and online innovation. And I continued to do that. I, every two weeks I wrote an article, and I continued to do that even when I kept, got back home in, uh, in Holland, in the Netherlands, in 2013, for a website, a Dutch website called uh, China 2025. And also some of my articles have appeared in Chinese radio and television and China uh, Nu magazine. Now, I write so much that basically every year what I do is I, I collect all of the, uh, the articles I write and I publish them in a little book. Uh, there's there's uh, printed versions of the book, there's also uh, e-book versions, so if you go to this, uh, this website here, chinatalk.nl, you will find uh, a lot of, uh, of these e-books, but also a lot of art articles and a lot of other videos and, and lectures. So if you find this stuff I'm going to tell you about today, interesting, then you should definitely go and, and check that out. What do I want to do today? Uh, normally this, this lecture is a bit longer. This is a, normally a lecture of one and a half hour where I take several cases that show you how China is no longer, especially on, on online and in websites and in social media and in apps, it's no longer a country that just copies what we are doing in the West, but they have started to innovate and sort of have turned the tables and it's the other way around now. Um, so normally I have more cases, but since we only have 45 minutes now, I'm specifically going to talk to you about WeChat. Has anybody ever heard of WeChat already? Yeah? Is anybody using it? Yeah. Few people, so... What I'm going to do is I'm going to sort of lead you through the whole uh, history of WeChat and how it was developed and how it uh, sort of became what it is now. And it gives you a better understanding of innovation in China. So we're going to specifically look at this, this case. Then we're going to wrap up by saying how did this happen? How did all of this innovation happen? And, and why is it different from the rest of the world? And what does it mean for us? If we have any time left, I uh, ha might have time to show you a, a five-minute video that sort of wraps up the whole story as well. So back to the beginning. In 2011, I arrived in China, and at that time, I was not extremely impressed by the social media that I found there. Like I said, I was working with these NGOs, and I had to help them do their promotion. But basically, everything I saw was a copy of Facebook. So you had... In this case, you see, this was my, uh, my interpreter um, I had in, in Xi'an uh, waiting, is her name, and she had a, um, a Sina Weibo account. And Sina Weibo is basically like the Chinese version of Twitter. But you had more different versions of microblogs, so you have also had uh, Tencent, Tencent Weibo, and you also had Qzone, and, and you had Renren. And Qzone was something that was uh, still linked to an instant messaging program called QQ. So it's a bit like MSN Messenger. I don't know if anybody still uses that, but it was a lot like that. And if you use that, you also had a, automatically a Qzone page, which was a bit like a Facebook page, uh, as we have here. And Renren, which you see um, on, on the right, that was something that was a real Facebook clone. It looked like Facebook, it worked like Facebook, it, but basically was exactly the same. Nowadays, uh, five years later, nobody 
Very few people are still using that because something else came along. But as I said, I, I was not extremely impressed by the Chinese versions of social media at that time. But then something changed. It was somewhere in the second half of 2011, and I noticed that a lot of people didn't talk into their phones anymore, but they started talking to their phones like this. And when you walked around in the street, you saw people that listened to their phones like this, like through the, uh, the, the outlet speaker for, uh, for your audio, not for your, your phone conversations. And I started asking my, my Chinese friends, what is this? What is this, this thing that everybody is using? And it turned out that it was a new app by Tencent called Weixin, or WeChat in, uh, in the West. And it became popular very, very quickly in China. It went very, very fast. So what I want to do is I'm going to lead you through the three phases that the app went through. And the first phase, it was basically a chat app. It was basically the first version of, of WeChat was like uh, WhatsApp that most of you will be, uh, be using. It had all of your contacts in a, in a contact book. You could send pictures, you could send uh, emoticons, you could send written messages, but was something that was already very um, very important to the, the app at that point is you could send chat messages, like voice messages. And every Chinese person started to use this. And the reason why they started to use this has to do with the Chinese language itself. Because if you look at the Chinese language, um, and I don't know if you've ever seen a Chinese person write Chinese characters on a, on a smartphone, but it's what they call mafan. It's like a hassle in, in Chinese. So it's really difficult to, to enter text because they, they have like 50,000, maybe even more, 50,000 different characters. And if you want to read a newspaper, you need to be able to uh, read and write about 5,000. So that's a lot more than the 26 characters we have in our, uh, in our alphabet. It also means that, uh, like I said, it makes it really difficult to, uh, to enter text. And there's basically three things that you can do if you want to enter Chinese text in a smartphone. The first thing you can do is you can simply draw the Chinese character on the screen. And then you can pick, here on the side, you can pick the right character. So it, is, it recognizes the character you, you mean. The second possibility is that you type pinyin. Pinyin is like the phonetical script of the, the pronounced uh, Chinese character. And then again, you have to, up here, you have to uh, pick the right character. And the last option, and I hope the sound is working. No, the sound is not working, but the last option is that you actually press the, uh, um, the button and you speak, uh, you, you enter a, a, a voice message, a spoken message, and that um, is then sent. And that, of course, is, is much faster because the, the message that was just sent three times was woman Daula. We have arrived. And in the first two, uh, two options, it takes about 20 seconds. And in the last option, it takes about two seconds to, uh, to send a message. So it made life really easy for, uh, for the Chinese, uh, Chinese people to use those voice messages. Now, to make it even more fun to have a chat conversation, uh, Tencent very quickly um, started to, uh, to implement stickers. So, in a conversation, in a chat conversation, you could have these stickers. They're like animated GIFs, like animated small cartoons that sort of convey a certain emotion or a certain meaning. And they also became extremely popular. If you have a chat conversation with a Chinese person, maybe like 30% of the total conversation is just sending each other stickers that, that have a certain meaning. And the cooler the stickers and the newer the stickers and the more trendy, the, the cooler you are as a person as well. What Tencent also did is they, um, they had certain stickers for um, the uh, 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 cartoon characters um, for, for famous movies, like in this case, the Minions from Despicable Me, and they sold them for like a small amount. This was the first, one of the first ways that Tencent started to, um, to earn money through WeChat. But so far, it was basically just a chat app, not very different from what you know as, uh, as uh, WhatsApp. But then they started to make it more of a social platform. They started implementing different things. 
that gave the Chinese, especially the Chinese young people, the opportunity to get in contact with other Chinese people. And they implemented what you see here, the uh, Discover menu. And the Discover menu has, certain, has several different options which you can use. First of all, which most people sort of recognize if you look at your uh, Facebook mobile app, is a timeline where you can again uh, share small videos, articles, you can share pictures. So this is really a lot like any uh, given social media platform. But they, what they also did is they implemented Shake. And what Shake does, if you open this option on the phone and you shake your phone, and it makes this clicking sound, then it will hook you up with somebody that is also shaking his phone at the same time. And that person will pop up on your screen. Normally when I say this, I start to hear all of the, uh, the people trying it out. Um, but it's a way to get in contact with new people. Another thing they did is they implemented Drift Bottle. And in Drift Bottle, what you can do is you can create like a virtual message in a bottle spoken or written, and you can throw that into a virtual ocean. And somebody else can sort of pick up random bottles from that virtual ocean. And if they like the message, they can, again, get in contact with the, uh, the, the other person on the other side. Um, even more direct is the option of people nearby, which you see here. In people nearby, if you turn that on, you can see everybody in your direct vicinity in, that is very near to you that has also turned this option on. And you can even make it uh, more handy by here in the top, you can filter on female and male. So this, this is, by the way, an option that has been uh, sort of abused as well. Uh, prostitutes in China use this a lot to, uh, to find customers. But every now and then, Tencent um, has a big cleanup um, of, of the uh, people nearby, because normally from the picture you can tell if this is somebody real or, or somebody that's trying to do business with you. So all of this leads to eventually being able to have like a direct chat session with somebody or have a video call or a voice call. So also that is incorporated in the app. Now, does anybody have any idea why this was so popular, so important for the app in a country like China? Anybody? You have to know a bit about the, uh, the, Chinese, uh, the Chinese society. One of the important things about the Chinese society is that uh, it's very much focused on marriage and having children and continuing the family line. Normally in their teens, Chinese kids are focusing on studying, 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 because they have to make a very high grade in what they call the Gaokao. And the Gaokao is the entrance exam to university. And that sort of determines the rest of their life. If they have a very bad score on the Gaokao, they might not get a good job and they might not get a good income later on. Once they are already in university, then it's normally the time that they have their first boyfriend or girlfriend. But as soon as they leave university, the parents and the whole family and everybody, their colleagues, they all sort of expect you to get married quickly and have kids. So there's even, uh, uh, there's a, there was a, a, a campaign by the Chinese government that told women that were 27 years old and were not married yet that they were leftover women. And they better find a man soon. Well, as a matter of fact, the China's big problem is that there's too many men, too many single men, because there's much more men than, than women because of selective abortions that have taken place during the, the one-child policy. But the reason why all of these apps, all of these applications, these functionalities in Weixin were so popular because it helped people to get in contact with, with other people and help them find friends and help them find boyfriends and girlfriends. So that was another critical success factor. What they also did is they implemented games. Tencent, the company behind WeChat, is basically a company that made video games, online video games. So Tencent wouldn't be Tencent if they didn't incorporate that in their own uh, new WeChat app. But what they did is they also made the games, even the games, they made them um, social. So what you could do is you could play a certain game. Well, this is one of the versions in the uh, international uh, WeChat version. And you could see how you did 
compared to your other friends that were, um, were playing the same game. Now, this is me up here, and I was not very good at this game. Uh, one of my friends, Leo, he was a, a student in Xi'an, he came from Brazil, and he was supposed to be studying, but I think that, I don't know what he's been doing the whole day, but it wasn't studying, because he got very good at, this, uh, at playing this game. Even when you wear stuff like these, these, these wearables uh, from companies like Xiaomi in, um, in China, you can share like, the number of steps and the number of uh, kilometers or miles you've, you've walked during a day, and you, compare that, you can compare that with all of your different friends. So even that is made social, and you can show off how well you exercised uh, at a specific time. Now you might ask, do people actually use all of these things? So this, these are figures from 2013, and at that time, there were almost as many people uh, that were using Weixin WeChat, uh, they were sending text messages as were sending voice messages. And moments, that's the, uh, the timeline, the Facebook-like timeline, 75% of the people were using that, and 62% of the people were doing group chats. So yes, the, all of these functionalities were uh, were used a lot in, uh, in Chinese society. Then, Tencent thought, okay, we've made it easy for people to contact each other, but maybe we should also make it easy for companies to contact um, consumers and consumers to contact companies. And what they did is they implemented the so-called subscription account. And a subscription account is, you can compare that to what we would uh, use in, in, in the West, uh, an email newsletter, where you can send one time maximum per day, you can send a message to, uh, to all of your followers, and they will receive these messages. This is a sign-up message, but once you sign up, you can actually frequently get information. But it could also be promotions and, uh, and discounts, so anything that a company, uh, or it could even be a, a private person, would like to share with his followers. So, a bit like a combination of a newsletter and, and following a Facebook company page. They took this one step further. They said, well, we have the subscription account, but we can turn this from sort of pushing information to the, uh, to the consumers, also to giving service to the consumers. And if you would have a service account, then you could also link it up with what we'll see a, a bit later, uh, WeChat Pay. Uh, WeChat Pay is a, uh, is a method to pay for anything you want through the, uh, the WeChat app. And you could then also buy things through, uh, through a service account of a company. This, uh, this one you'll see here, and I've got some more examples on the next slide, is uh, the, the service account of, um, of KLM, the Dutch uh, Royal uh, Airlines. And they even have the possibility to buy tickets straight through the uh, WeChat app. But you can also implement CRM, Customer Relationship Management, and you can have like a virtual loyalty card. You don't need to carry around a plastic card anymore in the WeChat app. So it went from just being a social app to being something that enabled you to, uh, to promote your company to being something through CRM, also enabling you to, uh, to service your customers. And these are uh, some more screenshots from the, the KLM service account. What's very interesting is that they, uh, they incorporate, KLM incorporate the, uh, the culture of China with their own branding, so that's why you get a blue dragon up here. And it, here's the option where you can actually go into the app and without leaving WeChat, you can buy a, a flight ticket on uh, the KLM service account. So still, this was slowly moving into um, a direction where people could buy things through uh, WeChat. And the next phase, the last phase of WeChat was basically uh, what, the, what we call M-commerce, mobile commerce, buying things through your smartphone. And the first option they had was a, a very simple scanner. You could, if you would see a product and you would scan the barcode that was on that product, like you see here. In this case, I was looking for uh, the Lonely Planet of Sri Lanka because I was visiting Sri Lanka. And I, I found a hard copy in a bookstore, but I wanted to know if I could maybe get it online cheaper. So I turned it around, scanned the barcode, and it gives you, in this case, three different web shops in China with the price you pay for that book in that web shop. 
And normally, most of the time, it's cheaper than the actual book you have in the, in the store. And this works with a lot of different products. So you'll see a lot of Chinese people taking their smartphone into the stores, scanning barcodes just to see if they can get it cheaper online. That was the, the, the first thing. But it really started taking off when they implemented what we call uh, WeChat Wallet. And WeChat Wallet is a digital payment option. Those of you who are using WeChat, you might not actually see the WeChat Wallet menu uh, because you're not located in China, but normally if you, imp if you install it when you're in China, you should also get this, uh, this menu. And this has really been like the, the big innovation in China um, and the driver for, for mobile commerce. But they needed some kind of incentive because for people to buy things through their mobile phone, they needed to hook up their bank account to their WeChat account because you need to somehow get money into your WeChat wallet. And they had two campaigns to stimulate this. The first campaign um, was about Hongbao. And Hongbao are so-called red packages. Red packages are like little red envelopes and people put some money in it. By putting that into a red envelope, it means that it becomes lucky money because red, the color red, is a lucky, uh, lucky color in China. So, Normally, these are handed out to small kids during Chinese New Year. They are handed out with bonuses to employees. So anything, they are handed out uh, at weddings. So anytime you want to give somebody a, a monetary gift, uh, uh, money as a gift, you uh, would wrap it into like this, uh, this red package and make it lucky money. So what Tencent did is they digitized this thing. And they also turned it into a game. So let's say I want to hand out 100 renminbi. And I have all of you guys in my WeChat account, so five people. And I send out 100 renminbi in red envelopes to all of you. But it doesn't mean that each of you gets 20 renminbi. Maybe you get one. Maybe you get 50. Maybe you get 10. So it randomizes, and thereby it turned it into like this this, this game, you, you want to get that envelope quick and see if, if you've got like the highest possible uh, uh, amount of money that you can get. And if you, of course, if you've received something, then you're sending out your own envelopes again because you're not just receiving, you're also giving away. That's the whole thing. But if you wanted to do something with that money, you also needed to hook up your, your bank card. So this was one of the campaigns that made Chinese, a lot of Chinese people link their bank account to WeChat. The second one, you might have heard about a company called uh, Didi. Didi is, has, especially in the West, become very, uh, uh, very well known because it bought Uber China. Um, and that was a few months ago. But Didi is basically an app where you can hail a taxi. Um, and what Tencent, in cooperation with Didi, what they did is they gave away a lot of discounts. They commissioned both the driver and the consumer. So if you would get into a taxi, which would normally uh, cost you like 20 renminbi, then during this period you would only pay 10 renminbi. But Tencent would also give the driver um, a bonus if he asked the, uh, the consumers to use WeChat for the ride. And I'll show you a bit later how it worked. But this also came, became very popular because a lot of people in China are using, uh, using taxis because only something like 11% of Chinese people have their own car. So they either use a pu public transport or a metro or taxis to, uh, to get to somewhere. And as you can see, within like three months, there were 100 million Chinese people that had used Didi Dacher. And had thereby also linked their bank account again to the, uh, the WeChat app. So these two campaigns sort of started snowballing the usage of the WeChat app. Now what, what I do when I'm in China, I really like to use this product, so I try to do as much as possible through WeChat. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples of how, like in a normal day, you can use WeChat to, to get around. You can actually, you don't, you rarely need cash anymore or your bank card. You can basically do everything through the, uh, the chat app. So like I said, um, Didi is about hailing a taxi cab. So 
So the first thing you do is you go into the app and you click on order taxi. Then you get this screen. You have to understand a bit of Chinese to, to be able to use this. But basically what it asks you is where are you and where do you want to go? Then if you hit the button, you will see a number that is sort of increasing. And that's the number of taxi drivers that has seen your message, that has seen your call for a cab. If this number doesn't really go up, you can even offer a tip and maybe they will respond uh, to you if, if they know that they can earn a bit more. But eventually one of the drivers, this is a driver, they will contact you and you can see in the actual screen where he is, how far away in both time and distance he is. And sometimes they might even call you to ask you where exactly you are. And then you can accept that right and, and get into the, the taxi by, uh, by confirming that here. Now, what you could do, you could basically only ride the taxi, but you could also say, I want to pay for the taxi ride with my WeChat account, with the, uh, the, the DD app, which is in an app. The first thing you'll do when you get into the taxi is you'll get the confirmation in the official account, in the service account of DD, so you can actually see who's the driver, what's the car number, what's his phone number, so that maybe if you, for instance, leave your USB stick or your computer in, in the car, you can always call him. And also, if there's any kind of abuse, you can also report it because you've got the details of, of the driver available there. But if you get out of the car, you can decide to, uh, to pay uh, in WeChat, so pay your, your, your cab fare in WeChat, simply by putting in the amount that you owe the driver, you either use your fingerprint as identification or you use a pin code or you have like a small amount still stored in your wallet and you'll see that it confirms um, the, the payment and then basically you've, you've paid. So you've hailed the cap and you've paid for it all within the WeChat app. Now it gets really interesting if you walk around China and you see some of your, uh, your favorite brands. This is a brand where you've got iSpeak I speak Bingful, and it's a sort of a Fanta-like drink from Xi'an. And I really like it. It's especially good with, uh, with cold noodles. So when I was waiting at a bus stop, I saw this bus pulling up, and I saw, I, I recognized the logo, and I saw a QR code, because in China, everything works with QR codes. So what I did is I went into the scan QR code, I scanned the QR code, and thereby I immediately follow the official account of the brand, Bingfeng. Immediately, I also see that when I follow that account, I've got this little menu down here, and it takes me into their web shop. And by following their account, they've given me five RMB discount uh, for like big packages of, uh, of the Ping Fong product, which if I order that in the app, they will deliver at my door this evening. So I order some of it, but I'm also thirsty now. So what do I do? I go into an underpass in Xi'an, and I come across this vending machine. And it's filled with all kinds of, uh, of soft drinks. And what you do is you pick a drink. And then this screen appears on top of the, uh, the vending machine. Again, a QR code. You, uh, you choose the, the method of payment because there's different uh, digital mobile wallets available. So I choose WeChat. I scan the QR code. I get this confirmation screen. And this button says, buy now. If I hit that button, the drink drops out of the machine. And I've all paid it. With, uh, with WeChat, with my uh, mobile phone. And this is ingrained in Chinese society. Within a few years, everybody is using this. In this case, I go into a supermarket, I buy some stuff because I'm going on the night train, so I need some instant noodles, and I'm invited to pay by WeChat when I approach the counter. So I go to QuickPay here. QuickPay actually brings up both a QR code and um, a barcode. And depending on the equipment that the, the shop owner is using, because most of the small shop owners, if you have a pop and mom shop, they don't really have uh, like barcode scanners available, but they can scan the QR code with their, their own phone. If you don't know how to use this, there's a big sticker at the, uh, the, the cash, cash register that explains how to do this. So I simply hand over my phone to the cashier, and she scans the QR code and I get a confirmation that I've paid for my groceries through my mobile phone. I do the same thing a couple of days later in Chongqing at Dairy Queen. Dairy Queen sells ice cream. 
I also bring up the QR code, and this, uh, this lady here simply scans my, uh, the, the, uh, the barcode on my phone, and I've paid for it. I can also, if I run out of mobile credits, most of the, uh, the, the, phones in, uh, the mobile phones in China are prepaid subscriptions. So if you run out, you can top up. You simply go into mobile top up. You uh, choose a certain value, and you've topped up your mobile phone again without having to go through all kinds of websites or, uh, as you had to do in the past, you had to go to a little shop and then give some money to somebody. You can do it from your mobile phone themselves. This is a very uh, nice one that I also saw in Chongqing. It's uh, called the Lomo printer. And I'd read about it, so when I saw it in one of those little souvenir shops, I, ha I just had to try it out. So what you do is this printer prints like Polaroid pictures. So the first thing you do is you scan the QR code, and then you pick a, uh, a picture from your mobile phone, which you send back to the account of the Lomo printer. What you can also do is you, uh, you can, um, let's see here, you can add some, some extra text that will be printed on here, and you will first get a preview of the result on your mobile phone. Then, when you pay for it, it just pops out of the printer. So something sent from your phone, a picture sent from your phone, printed with a subtitle, uh, with a caption, um, and you've also paid for it. It's just really, really fun to do. And this is a picture of, of me with my wife and my, uh, my parents-in-law. And I gave this to my mother-in-law. And it was the best thing that happened to her that day, if I, uh, um, if I, should, uh, uh, if I should believe her. So it's really, really good fun. At the end of the day, after all that sightseeing, we, uh, we don't really want to go to a restaurant anymore. So we decide to order some Waimai, uh, some uh, basically here in, in, in the Netherlands, you have thuisbezorgd.nl. Uh, uh, so you can also order a lot of stuff online and have it delivered at your home. This one is uh, called um, uh, Jabango, which means overtime dog. So it's for people that have to work very long and therefore cannot cook themselves or go to a restaurant. So they can order it online. You follow the official account. Then you immediately also get a coupon uh, that gives you a discount. And you go to the menu that says, uh, I want to order some food. In the app, you see the whole menu of all the stuff that you can, uh, can order from them. You order a couple of dishes. You order some more side dishes. You enter your, your address. You choose the delivery time. When do you want to have this food delivered? And you also can use the, the coupon immediately. You get a payment confirmation. Again, you pay through the, the app. You don't have to later pay the actual uh, delivery guy. Um, and you get an order confirmation. And at exactly the right time, there's a knock on the door, and this, uh, what they call a QID, a delivery guy, he turns up with a big box, and all of your food is, uh, is served on the table. Again, all of this done without even le ever leaving the, uh, the app. Now, there's much more, because you can, um, you can, let's see, what else is there? You can send money to friends. You can pay your gas, your water, your electricity through WeChat. You can uh, save your money in WeChat and get a higher interest rate than at the, uh, the normal Chinese banks. Public services, like you can pay your park tic parking tickets or, or other stuff you have to do with the government. And I'm very proud that, as a Dutchman, that you can now also go Dutch in the app, which means that you can split the bill with your friends, which is something that is becoming more more popular among, uh, among Chinese young people. It's not so popular with, uh, with the older generations. Um, you can donate to charity. You can buy flight and train tickets. And you can buy even movie tickets and pick the chair all within this one app. So it's all apps within apps. You can, in certain cities, you can make an appointment with the doctor through WeChat. You can have special offers, special discounts because Tencent works together with Jingdong. Jingdong is after Alibaba, the biggest e-commerce platform in China. Sorry? Because they're big competitors. And I'll, I'll show you in a minute, which also explains why, why they don't work together. But they're like the biggest competitors in China. So uh, Tencent works with Jingdong, which is the biggest e-commerce competitor of, uh, of uh, Alibaba. But Alibaba also has their own uh, payment, uh, payment option. 
Uh, Dianping is like a group buying, more like a Groupon type of website, so you can also see around you, in the area around you, where you can have special discounts at that moment. So basically, if you sum all of this up, this could be a Western smartphone, where you have all of, what we tend to do is we have one app that just does one thing very well. And then you need to have a lot of different apps on your phone. Basically, in China, you only need one app. You can do all of the things that you see on the, on the left side in WeChat. You don't really, and that doesn't mean that Chinese people are not using other apps, but you could do everything in, in WeChat. Now, like I said, this, this has become extremely popular, and you can see it in the growth here. It's now got 806 million users. About 100 million users of these are outside China. But really, WeChat is only very popular in China. So this is the different chat apps that you have and uh, where they dominate. And there's only one other country besides China where WeChat is a dominant, uh, the dominant uh, chat app. Any idea? You can see it on the map, but it's very small. It's, it's Bhutan. It's the only other country where WeChat is the biggest chat app. Now, you might think, again, um, do people use that mobile payment? Do they actually use it? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, send this uh, presentation, a PDF of the presentation, to Eric, so you can also, he'll, he'll make sure that you, you get it and you can have a look at the, the specific numbers, but it's used everywhere. Everywhere you go, you, uh, you will find uh, people paying through their mobile phones. This is uh, last week when I was back in Xi'an, and this is a street food. Uh, seller. It, she sells jambing, which is a really cool pancake with crabs and, 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 and uh, eggs and some spicy sauce. It's one of my favorite types of breakfast. And she even has her mobile phone here, and you can scan her QR code to pay five RMB for buying this in the street. So everybody, everybody is using this, uh, this payment method. Um, your question, why doesn't Alibaba work together with Tencent? Because they have their own app, Alipay which has a lot of the same functionality. And as a matter of fact, Alipay is still the dominant mobile payment. So even all of the stuff I've shown you of WeChat, there's more people using Alipay than, uh, than, than WeChat. So the question remains, how did all of this happen? How did all of this innovation take place in China while uh, we are trying to innovate so quickly here in the West? And the first reason is there's a thing called the Great Firewall. In China, it's impossible to get on Facebook, YouTube, etc., because it's blocked by the government, and it's blocked by the government because the government cannot control the content that appears on these, these websites. And they've seen the Arab Spring, and they've seen the, the role that uh, social media played, and they said, this is not going to happen to us. So we're, we won't allow uncensored Western social media in our country. But it doesn't mean that China doesn't have any social media. As a matter of fact, they have many more platforms than we have. Normally, if we have one YouTube, we have one Facebook, you had Google+, but that never really became like a big uh, success because they were too late to the market. And nobody is going to shift to Google+, if all of your friends are still on Facebook. But in China, you have, for most of the, uh, the different types of apps, you have multiple platforms. This also meant that something happened which did not happen in the West, and that's very fierce competition. Like between Alibaba and, and Tencent, they really had to compete to come up with the best app. And that doesn't really happen a lot in the West, because there is only one Facebook, there is only one YouTube, everybody's using the same app, and there's not a lot of competition. So the competition between especially Alibaba, Tencent, and Baidu, Baidu is the, the primary search engine in, uh, in China, but they also diversify. They have different uh, types of services, but it's the competition between these three that have, has driven up innovation in China. The last factor is also that a lot of Chinese people have come to study in uh, the United States, in the UK, in uh, mainland Europe, um, because they want a better education than uh, they can get in their home country. They also get a new way of thinking. They, they learn to be more creative. They learn to be a very good entrepreneur. And most of the very successful um, internet companies in China are actually started by Chinese people that have studied abroad and came back and started 
some of the very uh, big internet companies. So that's another factor. Now, all of this, if you're going to do business with China, that's, all of this is extremely interesting, but even if you never get into contact with China again, this stuff is extremely important. And why is it important? Why is it important for, uh, for our, us in the West? And I'll show you a couple of examples which uh, make that very clear. So WhatsApp in August 2013 implemented voice messaging, what I started my uh, presentation with in uh, sending each other spoken messages. We don't really, very few people are, are using that, but they, they did make it available. It was available in Facebook Messenger um, half a year earlier, but it's been available in WeChat since 2011. WhatsApp made it possible to log in through uh, WhatsApp web and have your chats through your PC or your laptop. And that's something that I've been using in WeChat already since 2012. Paying your friends in America is possible in Facebook Messenger since July last year, but already a year before that was possible in, in WeChat. Twitter has started to implement like conversation scrolls so that you can actually see everything in one conversation. That has been available in Sina Weibo ever since the start, basically, of, uh, of that application. Um, hailing a taxi ride through Uber became possible in Facebook Messenger December 2015 and has been available two years already before that in, in WeChat. This menu was recently implemented in Facebook Messenger, and again, that menu has already been in WeChat for a very, very long time. And even if you look at the, uh, the, the people, the management of, uh, of Facebook, they are admitting, this is Ronald Morcus, he's, he's uh, responsible for Facebook Messenger, the Facebook Messenger app, not the social platform, and he says it's Asia, Asia that is showing us the way what is going to happen. And this is a more recent one, where uh, Mark Zuckerberg said that they are going to implement um, payments through chatbots. It's a different approach, but it's also uh, going towards um, mobile payment through your mobile phone, through your social, uh, social media. Um, so this basically is, is the story I wanted to share with you. And uh, again, WeChat is one of the examples of innovation in China. Please go to the, uh, the website if you want to see more examples, if you want to have more information. Um, are there any questions left? Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, WeChat is uh, relatively popular in some emerging markets, especially in Southeast Asia. But it's basically the same reason why Google Plus didn't get very popular, because everybody is already using a different platform. Um, WeChat invested, Tencent invested something like $300 million in America to try to convince people to, to use that app. But without all of the payment options, which are not you, uh, available outside China, it's really basically just a chat app. And it's really not that different from WhatsApp. Plus the fact that the, the app being made by a Chinese company makes a lot of people sort of uh, suspicious about their privacy and their data. So these are three factors why WeChat has not really become, and as far as I think, will never become popular in the West. But what we do see is that the functionality will now be copied by uh, Western internet companies, whereas Chinese internet company, uh, companies used to copy uh, our Western internet companies. Yeah. Uh, no, it basically has to do with the fact that uh, you need li to link it up with a banking system, a financial system. Both Tencent and WeChat are taking steps to also make it available outside China by linking up with some, uh, some payment companies, some, some fintech companies here in, uh, in Europe, but also in America. But still, that's mostly aimed at Chinese tourists that go, for instance, to, uh, to Europe so they can pay in restaurants and they can pay in, in airports for the, the, the products that they buy. So, but it's probably a matter of time, Alipay, is, uh, is the biggest fintech company in the world already. And I think that it will be a matter of time before Alipay becomes like the big competitor of PayPal, because it's comparable in, in that way. So that's, uh, that's another idea. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah?
Yeah. Okay. Um, which type of mobile phones? iPhone is still quite popular in China. Samsung, until it started to explode, uh, was, was also quite popular in China. But they are basically uh, going down. But nowadays, you have uh, very good, high-quality Chinese smartphones at like half the price of what you pay for an Apple or a Samsung. Uh, that's, that's brands like um, Xiaomi and Oppo and, and Vivo. And they are actually sort of driving the other brands out of the market. What happens when you lose your phone? Basically, uh, what you can do is you, if you, have, you can sort of log out of your account when you log into a different device, so thereby your, your, your account is locked, and the amount is stored in your account. It's not stored on your phone, so if you log out of your account and log into a different phone, you still have your, your money available there. Yeah. Any other questions? Sorry? I think there's, there's two possibilities. I think the most likely uh, possibility is that uh, Facebook Messenger, as we've already seen here, starts to, um, to copy a lot of that in, uh, into their app. I don't think it will get as far as uh, WeChat has done, because a lot of people still find the idea of doing everything in one app a bit strange in the West. But Facebook Messenger is probably the, uh, the, 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 the most likely possibility. Another possibility is a, an app called Kick. And uh, WeChat was actually, um, in 2011, inspired by Kik, which is a Canadian app. And Tencent has invested in Kik. So they might use that to create a, a Western version. But they've done that almost a year ago, maybe even longer. But there's been no news uh, about what's been done. But they invested 500 million in, in Kik. So that's two possibilities. More questions? Yeah. The new thing, the, the, the new trend. Well, there's a couple of uh, trends in, in, uh, in China, and what you see is most of these trends get incorporated in apps like these. There's uh, VR, virtual reality is an uh, upcoming trend. Uh, live streaming, video streaming uh, is, is a very big new trend. And that is linked to the trend of what they call key opinion leaders or online celebrities, people that become a celebrity because they broadcast themselves. So apps like WeChat will start to incorporate functionality that also make that possible, because it's already possible in different apps or on different websites, but that will, uh, will also start to happen. Yeah, yeah. What, what the government does, the government doesn't really control uh, the, the content themselves. They make the internet companies responsible for controlling the content that appears the user-generated content that appears on their platforms. So the internet companies have a lot of people screening the content. And if, they, um, if, they have, uh, if, if there's a problem, then the government can say to a internet, Chinese internet company, you've broken the law and we will revoke your license to have, have your website. This also results in a situation where the internet companies are actually stricter than the government probably would want them to be because they're better safe than sorry, because they want to keep in business. Yeah. OK, I think, um, yeah, maybe one question. Yeah. Um, well, like I just said, they, they've tried to do that several times, but I don't think that it will catch on in, in the West. I think, I think there's no need, the, the Western consumer doesn't have the need for a product, especially if it doesn't have all of the payment options. So I don't see it happening, and I think that Facebook Messenger will actually uh, start to copy more and more of what WeChat is doing and become that uh, alternative in the West. Okay. Well, thank you for your, uh, your attention. Thank you.